Hello everybody, this is Dr. Beter. Today is May 26, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12. This issue completes the first year of the monthly AUDIO LETTER series, and what a year it's been! In his farewell speech as the first President of the United States of America, George Washington warned, In proportion as the structure of government gives force to public opinion, it is essential that public opinion be enlightened. That is what my monthly AUDIO LETTER is all about. Public opinion is always wrong when it's based on false and incomplete information and that is exactly what is served up daily by the Rockefeller-dominated major media under the guise of news. Every month I try to help you cut through the exhausting flood of Rockefeller propaganda in order to focus on more basic underlying matters. This month I want to pull together some of the most basic threads that run through everything I've been telling you about. After hearing this issue, I strongly urge you to go back and review what I have passed on to you in previous tapes, both my monthly AUDIO LETTERS and the AUDIO BOOK TALKING TAPES I've recorded. And always keep in mind that it is physically impossible to repeat everything from one month to the next to remind you of everything that's going on. Instead, every issue is devoted to matters which I believe will remain relevant for a long period of time. Whenever plans are later changed in any drastic way, I try to alert you to those changes. Otherwise you may assume that what I've told you in the past continues to have a bearing on what is happening today. What I want to do today is to try to give you a peek into the minds of the four Rockefeller Brothers and their allies. In other words, to show you what makes them tick. By this, of course, I do not mean a peep show, a prying into their personal behavior, even though they themselves have launched such gutter-level peep shows lately without total regard for truth or good taste to debunk the late President Kennedy, former President Nixon, former Vice President Agnew, among others. But I do think you have a legitimate and pressing need to understand in the clearest terms possible what they are trying to achieve, why they are trying to achieve it, and how they exercise vast power to suit their own purposes. As an old saying goes, know your enemy. The entire program of the four Rockefeller Brothers boils down to one of conquest and enslavement by any and all means. Wherever possible, Resistance to their schemes is reduced by using techniques which are not understood by the general public, and control of the major media through various fronts is used to help guarantee this lack of public understanding. But all of their most powerful techniques involve a common denominator, destruction. Economic destruction, physical destruction, destruction of individual choice, and whenever it suits their purposes, destruction of human life worldwide. My three topics today are Topic No. 1, Enslavement through Monopoly and the Destruction of Competitive Free Enterprise. Topic No. 2, Enslavement through Inflation and the Destruction of an Economy. And Topic No. 3, The Commitment to Enslavement through One World Government and Nuclear Destruction. 
Topic No. 1 In my home state of West Virginia, John D. Rockefeller IV, also known as J. Rockefeller, is breaking all records there for campaign spending in his bid for the Governorship. He is campaigning openly on the theme that he is too rich to steal, and he won the Democratic gubernatorial primary by a landslide. He spent over $4 million just to win the primary. Can you imagine? This is not to say that Jay would steal, but the fact that he can actually campaign on the too rich to steal theme is a vivid illustration of what has been accomplished by three generations of Rockefeller Public Relations, aided and abetted by ever-expanding Rockefeller domination of the major media. Jay's great-grandfather, John D. Rockefeller, Sr., was America's first billionaire by the dawn of the 20th century, but he most emphatically was not viewed as too rich to steal. Rather, he was widely regarded as too rich to trust because the source of his immense wealth lay in ruthless grasping and destruction of competitors. Through these methods the huge Rockefeller Standard Oil Trust had been built into a monster that was depicted in political cartoons of that time as devouring everything in sight. No wonder! An honest United States Supreme Court, not yet packed by the corporate socialists, ruled in its 1911 Standard Oil Company Dissolution Decree, and I quote, For the safety of the Republic we now decree that this dangerous conspiracy must be ended by November 15, 1911." Unquote. The Rockefellers, of course, paid no real heed to this legal order to dissolve their monopoly. For the sake of appearances only, their infamous Standard Oil Trust was carved up into several, into several allegedly separate companies, but behind the scenes Rockefeller control was retained over all of them through the use of nominees, banks, and tax-exempt foundations which hold the controlling interest in these companies for the benefit of the Rockefellers. The Standard Oil Decree of 1911 exemplified one very basic fact. The incredible fortune amassed by John D. Rockefeller, Sr. was acquired by unjust, corrupt means. It was therefore susceptible to being erased if justice were allowed to take its course. This posed an ever-present danger to the Rockefeller fortune to which the Rockefellers responded in two ways. On one hand, they launched the most elaborate sustained public relations program the world has ever seen in order to create a more favorable image in the public eye. The centerpiece of this campaign was, and still is, so-called philanthropy through an ever-growing complex of tax-exempt foundations. These were sold to the public as something-for-nothing devices, thoughtfully set up by the Rockefellers to help them give away their money for the public good without the slightest thought of benefit to themselves. The other side to the Rockefeller program was to continue the actual expansion of their monopolistic empire to ever grander proportions, using these very foundations to cover and hide their control and to escape taxation. Monopoly in business with the same motivation as before, greed. Soon this expanded into monopoly in labor by bringing into their camp more and more of the most important labor leaders. They were housebroken, and monopolistic control of money itself 
through their unconstitutional private central banking system, the Federal Reserve System. To protect their economic monopolism from being tripped up by law and justice, Rockefeller efforts spilled over more and more into control politics of our judicial system and of education. Soon after the troublesome Supreme Court decree of 1911, Woodrow Wilson became President, the first President to be a complete Rockefeller puppet, and in 1930 the Supreme Court acquired a new Chief Justice direct from the Rockefeller Standard Oil Stables, Charles Evans Hughes. This began the gradual packing of the Supreme Court which later reached scandalous proportions under Rockefeller puppet President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Key factors in the successful advancement of Rockefeller monopolism and the resulting destructive effects on American life were none other than the very foundations which were hailed in Rockefeller public relations propaganda as philanthropies. In 1917, Senator Chamberlain of Oregon warned on the floor of Congress, the Carnegie Rockefeller influence is bad. In two generations they can change the minds of the people to make them conform to the cult of Rockefeller or the cult of Carnegie rather than the fundamental principles of American democracy. Truer words were never spoken. And even as Senator Chamberlain made these remarks, Rockefeller termites were busily at work on Congress too, eating away the true representation of the people and leaving nothing but the weak, hollow shell we have today. By means of World War II, the Rockefellers acquired an economic weapon which enabled them to make a giant leap forward outdistancing all of their rivals both here in America and around the world. That weapon was their control of Saudi Arabian oil, whose surrender by Britain to the Rockefellers was the price of America's entry into World War II. The Saudi fields were then developed by GI Labor at practically no expense to the Rockefellers, who then obtained the oil for 30 years up until two years ago at just five cents a barrel. Using the tremendous windfall profits that resulted, hundreds of billions of dollars, the four Rockefeller brothers, operating through various fronts here and abroad, were able to buy up the industrial base not only of America but of Europe, Japan, Latin America, and elsewhere. Soon thereafter, global corporations under Rockefeller control posed an unprecedented economic challenge to the very sovereignty of nation after nation. Today, after three generations of relentless striving, the Rockefeller Empire, controlled by the four Rockefeller brothers, David, Nelson, Lawrence, and John D. III, is on the threshold of total monopoly here in America if they can implement their dictatorial New States of America Constitution. But you may ask, what does total monopoly really mean? How would it affect me? In a total monopoly, my friend, you would be surrounded, boxed in. You would be a complete slave, and to the extent that partial monopoly already exists, you are a half-slave already. This brings me back full circle to West Virginia once again. There on a localized scale you could have seen total monopoly in action not long ago. I've seen it with my own eyes. And I have to tell you, my friends, 
it was not a pretty sight. I have seen it over and over again all around my home State, miners working long, hard days in dangerous mines for low wages, which were not even paid to them in currency but in tokens called scrip. The miners and their families lived in houses owned by the coal company, paying their rent in scrip, houses which often would not have been accepted as meeting minimum standards anywhere else. For all the necessities of life, the miner and his family had to go to the company store, the only place where scrip could be redeemed. Years ago I knew a high official of a large railroad which owned coal fields in West Virginia. One day he tried to bring to the attention of the directors of a large financial institution in Cleveland, Ohio, which controlled the railroad, that prices in the coal company's stores were inhumanly high and kept the miners perpetually in debt to the company store. He said, why not pay the miners a living wage and reduce prices to a fair level in the company stores? At this the Director shouted Socialism, Communism, and within a few months they forced him into early retirement. Far from being a Communist or a Socialist, my friend was simply a Christian with a sincere concern about the working and living conditions of the miners. But the bank itself was controlled at the top by the Rockefeller interests, who are in league with the Soviet Union, which is run by nothing but a bunch of Communists. What irony! The same sort of thing is all around us today. The Rockefeller Brothers always make sure that they have plenty of spokesmen giving the lie that they support the free enterprise system when actually they are monopolists through and through. They are corporate socialists just as their counterparts under the Soviet system are state socialists. The goal of the Rockefeller Brothers for the United States is that our entire nation be brought under their total monopoly so that we can all be exploited as were the coal miners. Living in company-owned housing, buying the necessities of life at outlandish prices from the company store, paid in scrip which could not be redeemed elsewhere, and deprived of educational or other opportunities to break the vicious cycle they were in, the miners were economic slaves. Living a life of hard, dangerous work, they fought an ever-losing battle against mounting debts to their slave masters, the coal companies. They were not merely employed, they were consumed. They were disabled by occupational hazards like black lung and on-the-job injuries. They left destitute widows and children without pensions. A miner did not last indefinitely but the company didn't worry too much when he fell by the wayside. Generally he would be replaced without any difficulty by his or another miner's son growing up, caught in the same economic spider web, and if the Rockefeller Brothers get their way, we will all end up as their slaves, just like those miners in the coal fields then. Topic No. 2. We Americans today are becoming more and more like the enslaved coal miners of yesterday. We carry out our financial transactions in scrip instead of in real money. The scrip we use, called Federal Reserve Notes, is denominated in dollars, but it's not redeemable by your government for gold, silver, or anything else nor is it backed up by gold, silver, or anything else except the assurance of a corrupt government that we should think of it as if it were money. 
as I know from personal experience, even the blacks in the bush in Africa know that if the government is corrupt, the money is corrupt. But most Americans have been educated out of understanding that and are therefore learning the hard way now. The script that used to be paid to the West Virginia miners was not issued by the government but by their private employers, the coal companies. And in America today our script is not issued by the government but by the Federal Reserve System, owned and controlled privately by the very same Rockefeller-dominated corporations and financial institutions which increasingly control your job directly or indirectly, and from whom you must buy most of what you need. So our monetary situation in America today increasingly resembles that of the coal mining districts of yesterday. We hear a lot about the money supply and the balance of international payments, but as I explained three years ago in my book, the conspiracy against the dollar, these things no longer really matter under the monopolistic control of the Rockefellers. Inflation is produced now not by money supply, but as the result of the combined impact of big business, big labor, and big government compared with the real ability of the economy to produce now that our gold reserves have been stolen, and the balance of payments has been rendered obsolete by the Rockefeller multinational corporations, which can make the figures look any way they want simply by trading back and forth among themselves across national boundaries. As I also pointed out in my book, the alleged balance of payments deficit was used throughout the 1960s as a smokescreen, a cover to justify the hemorrhaging of America's gold reserves out of the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox and our other depositories and sending it overseas. Now that this has been completed, however, and the Rockefeller Brothers have cornered our nation's gold, the government has just announced that now it considers overall balance of payments figures to be obsolete and will stop publishing them. The United States dollar has been reduced to the status of pseudo-money, scrip, and it's going for broke. We're coming closer and closer to the day when the Federal Reserve script we use today, which is disguised for psychological reasons to resemble our real money of the past will be replaced in a reverse split of perhaps 100 to 1 by the Redbacks now stored in the mountain vault at Culpeper, Virginia, and other underground vaults. Like the coal miner's scrip, the Redback dollars will not be convertible to other currency. They will serve only for domestic transactions as we work as slaves for the Rockefeller corporate state and spend our red-back script at various branches of the nationwide Rockefeller Company store, embracing everything from housing to groceries. The Rockefeller Brothers want to eliminate your independence and to make you dependent upon them as a slave. That is why they want to control money itself, as well as the means of production, distribution, and supply of everything that money can buy. I can now reveal that if you have gold, their plan now does not call for it to be confiscated, but that it is because unlike the situation in 1933, so very few people now have any gold that the Rockefeller Brothers do not plan to bother with it since they have already cornered the United States monetary gold supply. We are to be left holding worthless paper money as the fruit of our labors. 
while the Rockefeller Brothers themselves hold our gold as the fruit of their crimes. They plan to make another great leap forward in their own wealth and power by turning our entire nation into one big slave labor camp for them to exploit at will by destroying the economy we presently have which does not yet give them total control. Topic No. 3 In Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 7, December 1975, I revealed that the Canadian Government has decided to strike out alone instead of being led down the road to Rockefeller domination. And now Canada is trying to defend itself against political and economic war being waged against it by the Rockefeller Brothers. It may come as a surprise to some people, but the Canadian Government, unlike that of the United States, is currently trying to act in the best interests of its own citizens. For that reason I seldom go into much detail about what the Canadian Government is doing because I do not want to upset its efforts to save itself. In a television interview in Ottawa on May 11, 1976, David Rockefeller said to his Canadian audience, quote, You face a dilemma. Are you more anxious to be completely independent, or do you want to see your resources develop faster with the aid of others? Unquote. He added that Canadians must choose between greater economic independence or increased prosperity. His statements reflect the intensifying economic pressure being applied to Canada by the Rockefeller interests. For example, they are now backing out of major commitments to develop Canadian oil reserves. This led a few weeks ago to a bombshell announcement by the Canadian Government that contrary to all past projections Canada will not be energy self-sufficient in the coming years after all. Meanwhile, the Canadian Government has struck back by turning down, for the moment at least, a fleet of Orion military aircraft built by the Rockefeller's Lockheed Aircraft Company. Whether it be individuals, companies, or nations, Competitors are always regarded by the four Rockefeller Brothers as a threat to be absorbed or eliminated. Where there is competition and diversity, there is always the chance, no matter how small, that they might somehow lose their position of supremacy. Losing that, they reason, they might someday be exposed and brought to justice and that could mean losing everything because their entire mode of operation is one of corruption, hidden manipulation, and flaunting of the laws that they impose on us peasants as they call us privately. So through a combination of greed and an ever-haunting concern for security, there arises an insatiable lust for power. And because evil practices confer vast worldly power, this leads to a conscious embrace of these practices that amounts to the worship of evil. Early in the 20th century, the Rockefellers of that day joined certain others who shared an identity of interest in such things to form a commitment to create a one-world government. This is what Nelson Rockefeller means today when he refers to an open world, no borders, no North and South Vietnam, no East and West Germany, no Virginia and West Virginia, and no taxes for his global corporations, just one stupendous world government the most awesome dictatorship of all time with himself as World President. 
to direct and coordinate the entire program under the One World commitment established two generations ago. The Rockefeller set up powerful tax-exempt foundations and used public relations to give them the halo of philanthropy. The first stage in this commitment, as I reported to you last month, was to embark on the deliberate use of war to so alter national life in the directions they desired. The second stage, which followed very quickly, was the forging of a covert partnership between the rulers of the United States and those of the Soviet Union whose Communist system was put into power by the same group of people. The wealth and know-how of the Western world, especially the United States of America, would be drained off to strengthen their ally, the Soviet Union, leading to the forced collapse of the United States. This would mark the dawning of the third stage one world government under a partnership between the Soviet Union and an America reorganized on the pattern of the Soviet system. To bring these things to pass, powerful forces were unleashed over 50 years ago, corrupt, dishonest forces. In 1920, for example, the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations arranged through the Guggenheim Foundation to establish scholarships to begin the rewriting of American history to create doubt about the principles laid down by our Founding Fathers. Carefully selected candidates were sent to certain universities in England for indoctrination, after which they were brought back and placed in strategic educational positions at the University of Chicago and sprinkled through other important institutions of higher learning. Through their positions of leadership, they would ultimately influence United States history teaching throughout America. The objective of this commitment was to bring on collectivism through the downgrading of the individual and the upgrading of the elitist group that planned to rule the collectivist world. At the same time, propaganda through entertainment, educational, and news media was to be designed to render people incapable of believing the truth about what was happening by making conspiracy theories of all types looked ridiculous, too silly to be taken seriously. In the more than half century since this One World commitment was formed, the trustees of the Rockefeller-controlled foundations have moved the One World program very far indeed, but the forces they unleashed are now running out of control. They have opened Pandora's box. And now they are beginning to see that they too are being swept along by the very same forces that they themselves have set in motion. More and more of the trustees of the Rockefeller-controlled foundations now believe that the commitment for a one-world government as originally conceived has jumped the tracks. And now they see the specter of a horrible end coming into sight just a little further down the road, a double cross by the artificially strong Soviet Union, with the Soviets picking up all the chips for themselves. But the mounting fear of the trustees still is not shared by the Rockefeller Brothers themselves. Loyal, patriotic members of the United States Intelligence Community inform me they are grinding their teeth in frustration because the efforts of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to upgrade American defenses 
against a very real Soviet threat are being vetoed at every turn by Nelson Rockefeller through Henry Kissinger. The Rockefeller brothers firmly believe that war is coming and soon, but even now they still believe the Soviets will abide by their secret agreement for a completely programmed war when that phase of World War III or Nuclear War I is reached which calls for nuclear warfare on American soil. David Rockefeller and his affluent intimates still think they hold the upper hand with the Kremlin bosses through various devices. For example, there are several casks of radioactive plutonium-239 superpoison stored by the CIA on the fourth floor of the central building of the United States Embassy in Moscow. These were taken there in 1971 from the Fort Knox Bullion Depository by the CIA to be maintained as a blackmail threat against any tricks by the Soviets. Like those which remained in the Fort Knox Bullion Depository, they began leaking long ago and are responsible for the leukemia now suffered by Ambassador Stossel and others in the Embassy. This is the truth behind the cover stories you saw recently alleging that health problems in the American Embassy in Moscow were being caused by Soviet microwave radiation. But why expect the government to worry about a few mere employees at our Embassy in Moscow? Exactly the same kind of radioactive superpoison has for months been spreading through underground streams from Fort Knox into the southeastern United States. One of the most immediate threats from the CIA superpoison is an underground concentration centering on Chattanooga, Tennessee. This hot spot extends 23 miles west, 25 miles south, 42 miles east, and northward toward the source which is Fort Knox, Kentucky. The water supply for over a quarter of a million Americans is threatened, yet the Federal Government still refuses to tell the truth about this deadly threat. David and his brother still believe also that the Soviet need for trade with their global corporations will keep the Soviets in line, adhering to their secret commitments, but how wrong they are. To get ready for the war, David Rockefeller has just built a new fortified family hideaway on Bartlett Island adjacent to Mount Desert Island off the coast of Maine where other Rockefeller strongholds are now in existence, complete with bomb-proof shelters. The latitude of Bartlett Island is 44 degrees 22 minutes north, almost the exact center of the super-secret nuclear safe zone which has been established for the Rockefellers and their affluent intimates in America during the coming war. This zone is a band across roughly the upper half of the United States and including the lowest portions of Canada. It extends from 40 degrees to the south to 50 degrees on the north, and the center is 45 degrees, almost the exact latitude of the Rockefeller compounds off the coast of Maine. That in fact is why 45 degrees was chosen as the center of the nuclear safe zone. Members of the Rockefeller Inner Circle who are in the know about all this have been buying real estate in Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and the Dakotas, as some of you may have noticed who live in those states. Now you know why. Now you also know the real reason why our anti-ballistic missile installations 
which were located within the nuclear safe zone were dismantled last year. The upper half of the United States is to be a virtual demilitarized zone except for some military installations which have been around too long to deactivate without arousing suspicion, but they would not be used against the Soviet Union in NUCLEAR WAR ONE by the United States. Just look at a map of the United States, my friends. Look at the enormous nuclear disaster that is in store for us if the Rockefeller Brothers and their Soviet allies are allowed to carry out their insane plans for total conquest. Alaska, which lies above the nuclear safe zone, is scheduled to have its now uncompleted oil pipeline blasted out of existence. Hawaii, below the nuclear safe zone, is scheduled to be hit to knock out the naval installations there but our real Pearl Harbor this time is to be the Panama Canal, as I revealed 19 months ago in my AUDIO BOOK TALKING TAPE No. 1, HOW TO PROTECT YOURSELF DURING THE COMING DEPRESSION AND THIRD WORLD WAR. AS FOR THE CONTINENTAL UNITED STATES, CALIFORNIA, NEVADA, UTAH, COLORADO, KANSAS, MISSOURI, ILLINOIS, INDIANA, OHIO, PENNSYLVANIA, Delaware, New Jersey, and all states south of them are immediate candidates for nuclear attack, even if there is no Soviet double-cross of the Rockefeller Brothers. As I first warned on radio in June 1974, not only the Panama Canal but American cities are already targeted by nuclear missiles in the Republic of Guyana next to Venezuela, ready to strike from the south where we are weakest. Americans really cannot believe the terrifying possibility of nuclear war, feeling that neither the Soviet Union nor the United States would risk its own destruction. But the Soviet Union spending over a billion dollars a year on massive civil defense preparations is ready to survive NUCLEAR WAR ONE, unlike ourselves. And the Rockefeller Brothers and their intimates are ready to survive it too with their fortified hideaways in the NUCLEAR SAFE ZONE. But for the rest of us, my friends, the only war preparations are the mass burial sites which are now being quietly set aside without explanation such as the 80-acre site in Wood County, Wisconsin. My friends, this is war, and you, your loved ones, and everything you hold dear are the targets. We are being attacked without mercy and the weapons being used against us are the weapons of evil. We must fight back now while we have the chance, not with the power of evil, however, but with the power of truth, which I still believe is more powerful than the most evil plans men can devise. Here's what we must do now. First. We must stop the insane plans for America's destruction in NUCLEAR WAR ONE, which I am convinced will be even worse if it is allowed to take place than the Rockefeller Brothers planned because of certain Soviet double-cross. All aid and trade with the Soviet Union must be cut off, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff must be freed to take the proper measures to protect our country against the Soviet Union. There's no time to be lost. Every Governor, every Senator, every Congressman, every State Legislator, and every Mayor in the States, including or below the 40th parallel, plus Alaska and Hawaii, has an immediate duty and responsibility for the lives of the citizens they represent. That duty is to demand 
that Secretary of State Henry Kissinger publicly reveal the secret war plan agreements with the Soviet Union which established the nuclear safe zone I have described. These agreements are now in the possession of the four Rockefeller brothers in their hideaways on Mount Desert Island and adjacent Bartlett Island off the coast of Maine. Every single one of the officials I have described must be alerted to this plan, and if need be, forced by public pressure to demand this public accounting from Kissinger. Any official who refuses to pursue this life and death duty once alerted and pursue it vigorously will be knowingly jeopardizing the very life of every man, woman, and child he has taken an oath to protect. Second, we must block the program of the four Rockefeller brothers to eliminate our beloved free Constitution and replace it with their own dictatorial New States of America Constitution. The same officials I have just mentioned, but for all 50 States, must be alerted to this plan and must be pushed by public pressure into action. Have no illusions, my friends. Neither Congress nor most of the other officials I have mentioned will do anything whatsoever about either of these things on their own. With rare exceptions, they respond only to pressure, and usually that pressure comes only from powerful special interests, which these days usually means the four Rockefeller brothers and their total lackeys. But if they are alerted to these terrible dangers and are kept under constant, unrelenting public scrutiny and pressure, I believe Congress as well as the other officials can be mobilized on both of these particular matters, the war and the Constitution to do what must be done to save our country, because this time their own survival is at stake as well as ours. What you must do in this terrible situation is something that does not come easily to most of us. You must get off the sidelines and into the fight. You must speak out about what you know even though many may not yet believe you. You must search out others who share your concerns, once alerted to our common danger, and who will join with you to take action under our Constitution to prevent disaster. And you must get your priorities straight. The situation is not a liberal, conservative, black, white, Jew or Gentile, Democrat or Republican issue. It's a matter of survival, literally life and death, and survival as well as of the system which allows all these individual differences among us to continue to coexist. You must join with others in your area, even if it is only one or two at first and figure out what your particular group can do to bring the pressure for action that I have just described. Do you have an independent newspaper in your area whose editor will listen to the truth and perhaps follow up on it with his own investigation and editorials? Is one or more of you a member of a lodge where you could bring up these matters and generate support for action? Can you rent or borrow space at a church or school to hold public meetings where more people can be informed through tapes or other means? Take stock of your own resources, whatever they are, and use them. And don't ignore your financial resources, be they large or small. Would you rather use a portion of your worldly goods in order to preserve an entire way of life? Or would you rather sit back and let it evaporate uselessly through Rockefeller-induced inflation and the searing heat of nuclear warfare? 
Remember, you count. The Rockefeller Brothers and their affluent intimates are powerful, but their power is exercised through the willing minds and hands of millions of others who, for the most part, do not even know that is what they are doing. You and I are not confronted by a whole nation of enemies, but just a very few individuals who have learned how to push and maneuver others into doing their bidding. So if you feel outnumbered, don't. As far as our real enemies are concerned, those at the top, we now outnumber them. So what in the world is the sense in letting them enslave us? My friends, I have told you what I think we must focus on and fast. In December 1975 I also recorded AUDIO BOOK No. 6, What We Can Do to Save America, to give you some thought starters, and I know that some of you are pursuing suggestions I made then. But beyond that, I believe you must use your own initiative to see how to put things together to work your way working with others in your area. Under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, you are guaranteed the right of peaceable assembly for a reason. Use it. You are also guaranteed the right to petition government for the redress of grievances. Use it. And keep in mind always that under the Ninth and Tenth Amendments it is to us, the people of the United States of America, that the ultimate power of our government is reserved. Use it or very soon you will lose it. My friends, the time has come in your life when your future depends on your willingness to face up to reality and to act. I understand your attachment to things you have worked so long and so hard to acquire and achieve, and yes, there is a risk involved in doing as I am urging you to do, a risk of being ridiculed by some a risk of losing money, and even a risk of failure. But the element of risk is now reversed from what we usually think. The real risk now lies in not taking action, because if you don't take whatever action you can, you risk letting the Rockefeller Brothers succeed in their insane plans and thereby losing everything. As I begin the second year of the monthly AUDIO LETTER SERIES next month, God willing, I plan to keep on providing you with the information you need in order to do your part to save yourself, your loved ones, and our nation. Will those who have exercised vast power through covert means on behalf of the Rockefeller Brothers continue now to throw in their lot with their masters now that they see at last where this is leading? Or will they choose to begin making amends for the evil forces they have unleashed against us, the people who are the United States of America? Never before in the history of our United States has this phenomenon occurred that one family controls the destiny of this country, and whatever happens, I consider myself honored to be placed in the position that I am now in to join with you in the fight to move our great country forward once again on the path laid out by our Founding Fathers. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.